good story. We are, we are on week three. Okay, this is message number three of a three-part series uh, that's labeled When God Doesn't Make Sense. Uh, last week, or last time that we met on this series, we talked about when God is late, and we went over a New Testament story of Lazarus and the timing of when Jesus showed up. Uh, and this week, we're going to talk about when God seems uncooperative uncooperative it's those times when it seems that everything in the world is going against you and you believe that god is seemingly not around or is possibly working against you and i believe that today's story from the old testament and we're going to spend time in the old testament and it's an awesome story uh, this story will help create a foundation for us to understand, for us to maybe just a little bit better um, understand God's attentiveness. God is all-knowing. And for us to learn to depend on Him during those times when God seems uncooperative. Have you ever had one of those days... Right, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, some of you right now, you're like, I'm having one today. No, okay, so have you ever had one of those days, one of those months, one of those years, um, a couple of birthdays ago? So this was before we moved out here. I want to say it was my birthday before we moved out here. Um, it was my birthday. And in Ohio, on your birthday, you get blessed with the opportunity to uh, re-register your vehicles every single year, okay? And so you have to turn in your vehicle registration, and uh, that, that season of our life, uh, financial means was very, very lean. Matter of fact, I remember that day that we looked at our checking account, and we had just enough money to re-register both of our vehicles and then to fill up our vehicle, like one of the vehicles, uh, partially and so uh, it, it was gonna be a tight week you ever had a tight week right so you're like okay we're juggling things around but uh, we're, we're gonna be able to make it so on the way to the BMV um, I stopped to get the gas and while I was at the gas station our minivan doesn't start okay so I was so I put I literally pushed it forward to a parking spot because I was in the gas pump. So I, I pushed it forward and and like everything it seems like I was pushing the last minute for the BMV appointment. So I call up my wife. I said, "Kate, the van's broke down. Would you mind jumping in a truck, loading up all the kids, right, and coming and picking me up? The, the van broke down, but before we fix that, we got to get to to the BMV." And get the tag the tags done, and then we can come back and do it because there's a big old you know like twenty five or fifty dollar penalty. So she's like, "Yep." So so she she jumps into the truck, heads over to the gas station, and as she's pulling into the gas station, our truck broke down. Okay, we only have two cars, so the van's broke down, and right next to it is our broken down truck, and it's getting later. Okay, so now so now I call my mechanic friend who lives literally right around the corner for us. I said. Uh, hey, can you come pick us up? And here's a really odd request. Before before you come pick me up, can you drive me over to the BMV so I can get these tags done, and then we can take home my truck, take home my van, and then maybe we can fix the vehicles. And uh, so he does that. He comes over. He picks me up. Um, we go over to the BMV. The family's going crazy in the vehicle. I come back. We drive them home. And then we, then, we, then we start the process of towing both of our vehicles back to my house, okay? So it, I th it, this is a Friday, and I, I, I just looked at him. I said, I, I don't know what to do. And he, I go, I think I, think I can fix it. Um, I was like, I just, I just need space. And he says, well, you can use my garage, okay? You can use my garage. He's like, but here's the thing. you got to be done by 8 o'clock in the morning because he goes, I'm swamped with work tomorrow. And you got to get you, you can use the lift, but you got to get get out by the morning time. And he was going out with his wife that night. I was like, okay, not a problem. So it's my birthday. This is really heavy on my mind. We really don't have any money, and uh, yeah, 
they had planned like the steak dinner and we had jello cake and stuff like that and I immediately had to like eat with them real quick and then go and I don't know about you but when there's something like that going on that's all I, I, I tend to do right think about I kind of get that zone uh, my, my kids my kids they make fun of me sometimes we'll be at the dinner table and they'll be like dad and I'll be like what and they're like you're looking like this again and I'll be like oh really they're like yeah it's kind of weird looking uh, so I get the zone and, and that's how I was and I, I went out I went out to the to the garage and I worked on my vehicle uh, that night what do you do when God seems uncooperative what do you do when you're thinking you should go left and it seems everything in life wants you to go right what, what, what do you do when when you think everything is blue and yet someone's telling you it has to be red and, and it and it just seems like there's these events that happen and, and and there's days or there's months or there's years where those things are compounded upon each other and and and, and it just seems like you're blindsided and and it, it you're just, you're just like man it's not working it, it's like it's it's a big struggle can I just get a break today we're going to look at the story of twelve brothers and dad whose reality is, is that God okay and we're going to see this we have a wonderful opportunity we're going to see a third person view into the story and we're going to see that God has a bigger play going on in their lives and even though they can't see it in the short term it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist God is still doing it and it's during those times that I want to say this as, as humans, as, as men and women who, who know Christ but also still struggle with our flesh, it's easy to blame God. It's easy to blame God. It's easy to blame others. But this is, this is the whole point. But it's time to trust in God. It's easy to blame God. It's easy to blame others. But in reality... It's time to trust in him. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42. We're going to see a little vignette in the story of Joseph, uh, which starts around chapter 37. But we're going to jump in at 42, and all his brothers are a part of the story, and his dad uh, are also a part of this. And this is where we're going to find find our story this morning for us today when God seems uncooperative. The main, the, we're going to cover a lot of scripture, but the, the main part starts at verse 26. So Genesis chapter 42 and in verse 26, I'm going to start reading there. Then they loaded their donkeys with grain and departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw money in the mouth of his sack. He said to his brothers, My money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At their hearts, and at that moment, their hearts failed them, and they turned trembling to one another, saying this, What is it that God has done to us? And when they came to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them saying that the man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. But we said to him, we're honest men, and we've never been spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our fathers. One is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to them, By this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me, and take grain for the famine of your households, and go your way. Bring your youngest brother to me. Then I shall know that you're not spies, but honest men, and I will deliver your brother to you, and you shall trade in the land. As they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to him, 
you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is now no more. And now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. Then Reuben, the oldest, said to his father, will kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. But he said, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he's the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are, or that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. Now in chapter 43, now the famine was severe in the land and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to him, Go again and buy us a little food. But Judah said, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send your brothers with us, we will go down and we will buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, Why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, Is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said to Israel's father, Send the boy with me, and we will arise, and we will go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety, and from my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. We have not delayed. We will now have been able to return twice. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choicest fruits of the land in your bags. Carry a present down to the man. A little balm, a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the money with you and carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps... It was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise and go to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I'm bereaved of my children, I am so bereaved. Father, thank you, Lord, for Scripture. Thank you for the opportunity for us to be able to gather in the name of Jesus this morning and for us to be able to, to spend time in your word. Teach us, Lord, from truth. Let us see who you are. Let us see who we are. And let us walk away from here changed into the image of Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you would meet with us this morning, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give you just a little bit of background. So this is a very large story, and we're just jumping into part of it. And a lot of you probably have read this story before. Uh, but just some background before we kind of get into it. Number one, God promised to Abraham uh, his grandpa. Okay, so God promised to Abraham, which is, jo which is uh, Jacob's grandpa, right? Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. He promised to him uh, that, that the children of Israel would spend 400 years in a foreign land and would be servants in that land. Okay, that's a promise. And the events that we read are is, is part of that thing that's going to happen. Okay. Number two, we need to realize that Joseph, right, when he was 12 years old, he had these two dreams. Okay. And these two dreams set up or continue or really uh, fo continue to foster this resentment that, these ten brothers had for Joseph, okay? Benjamin was probably too young at the time, right? So Joseph had these two dreams, and in the dreams, get this, in the dreams, uh, the dreams are is that one day the brothers would bow down to him, okay? That's dream number one. Dream number two is not only will the brothers bow down to Joseph, mom and dad will join the brothers in bowing down to him, okay? So let's just say, Joseph wasn't a popular guy in the family, right? Now, I think, I think his dad loved him. His mom loved him, obviously. But there was, there was already this type of favoritism, and these dreams only made it worse. They really, really started to resent Joseph. And as a result of that, uh, Joseph was sold into slavery by whom? 
right? His brothers, his brothers, they went out on this field trip together, and in that trip, they 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 they're either going to toss him in the pit for some raiders to find him, or and this is the plan they came up with: they sold him into slavery, right? That's some deep rooted bitterness there. Okay, now how many of you have brothers and sisters? All right, make sure you're thankful for them. Okay, all right. So so there so Joseph is sold into slavery. Now after that, right? So Joseph is then uh, he rises up quickly into this this Egyptian uh, government structure and he becomes he becomes like a, a great assistant to this guy named Potiphar now things become really well for him because Joseph is a good guy however uh, Potiphar's wife betrays him right accuses him falsely of some things and now Joseph is tossed in the prison right have you ever had one of those lives okay so he's tossed in the prison. Now, he's in prison for a very, very long time. And after a while, though, he, he gets another opportunity for, through his gift of being able to interpret dreams. He gets another opportunity to not only get out of jail, but eventually he becomes number two, the number two guy in all of Egypt, right? I mean, I mean he, he, gets, he goes from the prison to number two guy to, in, all of G, in all of Egypt. And... He ends up, in that role, he ends up managing all of this surplus, this food that's needed during this famine. So it's predicted that this famine's going to come. He gets a heads up on it, and he says, hey, this is what we need to do in order for us to last and to live through this famine. And the plan works, and that's where they're at now. So there's this great big famine. It's not only uh, hitting Egypt, but it's also hitting the land of Canaan as well. This story takes place 22 years after Joseph was was sold into slavery and 430 years before the Exodus, right? Moses and the Exodus. You guys understand where we're at now, right? 22 years after Joseph is sold into slavery, 430 years before Moses and the Exodus. And here's one more thing that we, we need to go over real quick. You'll notice... That Jacob, his name Jacob and Israel is kind of used in the same story, right? And we're going to kind of go over the events of when that happened. But Jacob, the dad, he's named Jacob, but he's also named Israel. And that plays a little bit important part a little bit later on. If you're taking notes, I want you to write down this first thing. It's easy to blame God. It's easy to blame God. Go ahead and look to the person, uh, either left or right, pick one, and say it's easy to blame God. All right. It's easy to blame God. So there is. So so here's where we're. So we're going to pick this up. Uh, Jacob sins. And we're going to actually start in the first part of 42 here. So Jacob sends the brothers. Okay, minus Joseph. Joseph is gone. He's sold into slavery and Benjamin. He doesn't send Benjamin. He's the youngest. Okay, he doesn't want to send him out there. So he sends the 10 brothers to go down to get food because there's famine. There's famine not only in Egypt, but also in the land of Canaan. And so Jacob sends his brother over, the ten brothers, over to Egypt to get that food. While they're there, so while they're waiting in line, okay, while they're waiting in line, Joseph recognizes his brothers. Joseph recognizes his brothers. And what ends up happening? What ends up happening? Look at verse 6 with me. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold all to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces. So the dream comes true. The dream comes true. The, there's their brothers. They end up bowing before Joseph. Now, they didn't recognize Joseph, right? Joseph has been missing for 22 years. He's been raised and has grown up and has matured as a man in Egyptian culture. He probably physically looks different. They do not recognize him. And he takes that as an opportunity to test them. He takes that as an opportunity to test them. You know, is he a brother? That messes with them, maybe, right? But he takes it as an t- opportunity to test them. It's not only his plan, 
but we're also going to discover that it's also God's plan. So now we're going to read, and, and we're going to jump down to verse 23 and 24. So jump down to verse 23 and 24 of Genesis 42. Then they turned away from them. <clears throat> I'm sorry, turn to uh, verse 21. So, so, they're, so they're in line with one another, okay? So, so they're standing in line, and Joseph now starts to hatch this plan, and he wants to see all of them, and especially he wants to see Benjamin. Why does he want to see Benjamin? Here's my guess. It doesn't really come out and say this, but Benjamin is actually his full brother. Right, so out of all the twelve brothers, right, uh, most of them are half brothers, and then but Benjamin is actually his full brother. That's the reason why I think he wants to see him specifically. So he so he comes up with his plan and he says this. He goes, okay, he goes, you guys are spies, and they're like, what? He goes, you guys are spies, and they said, no, 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 we're not, no, we're not spies. We're just here to get food. He goes, I think you're trying to check out our land. And, he, and, he, and they said, no, we're not spies. So then, so then he hashes his plan. He says, okay. He goes, you know what? If you want to prove to me that you're not spies, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take one of you hostage, okay? I'm going to keep one of you, Simeon. All right, I'm going to keep one of you, and then you're going to go back, and then you're going to go back and get your brother, and you're going to bring him back. You're going to prove to me that you're telling the truth, that you're just 12 brothers, and you're here to get land. And they're like, Actually, look at verse 21 here. Verse 21. Then they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us, right? So 22 years ago, they did this terrible thing to their brother, and now here they are. They're in Egypt, and they're like, that act is coming back to haunt us. They have no idea that he's actually standing right there in front of them, but their guilt inside is completely tearing them apart, and they're like, oh no, this is coming back, and this is coming up to catch us right now. So what he says, he says for them, well, actually, he has to take a moment. Look at verse 23 here. And in verse 23, it says, they did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept. He turned away from them and he wept. And he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from them and bound them before their eyes. And in verse 25, And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and, what does it say here, to replace every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for his journey. This was done for him. Now, when he put their money back in the sack, did, did, did he think that it would have the result that it would? I don't know. I, I, I knew it's clear in Scripture that he was testing them. What, did, did he know that the money was going to have such an impact on him that it did? I don't know, but I know that God knows, right? God knows that it was going to happen. And so he, gives them, so he gives them back their money. Now look at this. On their way back, okay, on their way back, they're having one of those days. Okay, there's famine in the land. They're hungry. They need to fill their bellies. They go to Egypt, right? They go to Egypt, and then they end up having to bow before somebody else. They bow before him, and then that person accuses them falsely of being spies. So now they're on the defense. Not only that, one of their brothers now gets cast into prison, right? Gets cast into prison, and they have to go back, and they have to get their brother, whom dad doesn't want to come, so they got to go back and bring him back just to be able to clear their name. They're tired. Their horses are tired, right? They stop. They open up the bag, and there is this tribute money that they gave sitting in. They accused us of being spies, and now there's money in our bag, money that we gave them, and now it's returned to us. They're like, oh, this, we are, this is it. We look guilty guilty and look what they said look what they said here we'll look at it in verse uh, 27 look at this and then in verse 26 and they loaded up their donkeys with grain and departed and as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lotter place he saw his money in the mouth of the sack verse 28 and he said to his brothers my money has been put back here it is in the mouth of the sack and at and at this their hearts failed them 
And they turned, trembling to one another, saying, and what did they say? What is this that God has done to us? What is this that God has done to us? Number one, it's easy to blame God. Number one, it's easy to blame God. When everything seems to be uncooperative, it's easy to blame God. You know, it's amazing how spiritual we get when things go tough, right? When things go tough, it's amazing how spiritual we get. But let me tell you, when things get tough, and my conversation between me and God may not exactly be spiritual, right? I mean, if you could have put a tape recorder in my garage the night that both my trucks broke down, my family is inside, I'm outside having to work down, listen, it, it wouldn't be one of my best shining moments. I, I, I mean, I distinctly remember this. I, I distinctly remembering looking at my broken down truck, and <laughs> I don't know why I do this, but it's always this, you know, uh, symbolic, you know, I, I pull out my pants and I have like the bunny ear. There's no money inside my pockets. And I'm just like, not only am I broke, I'm broke. I'm broke on my birthday. And, and, and quite honest, I, I know in my mind, I probably said things like this, God, what, what's going on? What, what, why, why, why is this happening? Well, what am I supposed to do? What, both my vehicles? Really? I, I don't know about you. In times like that, sometimes they even ask, the, is somebody messing with me? Right? Does someone sabotage my vehicles? E even, though, even though I wasn't praising God at the moment, there's a sense that I know that he knows what's going on. Even though I'm not praising him, just the fact that I'm responding to him communicates the fact that I know that he knows what's going on. Amen? And even though we're not praising him, that's a truth. Matter of fact, I want to show you from Scripture other passages of Scripture that communicate this. Uh, Psalm chapter 33, verses 13 through 15. Psalm 33, from heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all who considers everything they do. The next one, uh, Psalm chapter 14, uh, 147, 4 through 5. He determines the numbers of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Here's the next one, uh, Psalm 139, verse 4. David said, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. And before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. It's easy to blame God. They blame God, and it's easy to blame God. Number two, if you're writing this down, go ahead and say, or, uh, write this down, it's easy to blame others. It's easy to blame others. When everything is going wrong, it's easy to blame others. Verse uh, 29, And when Jacob, and when they came to Jacob the father in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. Took us to be spies of the land. They shared their terrible experience with dad. And they shared with them everything that had gone on. And at the end of that, they opened up their sacks. And not only was their money returned to one of them, all the money was returned to them. Every single one of them. And Jacob completely lost it. He completely lost it. He's like, what did you guys do? Right? As parents, you know, sometimes... We talk to our children when we come in and there's that disaster all around the house. What's going on here? He goes, is it not enough? Is it not enough that Joseph has already been removed from our family? Now Simeon, he's being, he's being held captive in their jail. And you want me to give Benjamin? Now Benjamin, my youngest, my baby, you want to take him back so they can kill him too? 
He goes, you bereave me of all my children. You are, you are uh, taking, you are removing all of my children from me. And he shuts it down and he says, no way. No way are you guys going to do this. Reuben, Reuben steps up. So Reuben's the oldest brother. How many of you are the oldest children, okay? All right, so Reuben steps up, and, which is good, because Reuben was one of the major guys who should have stepped up more when Joseph was sold into slavery. Okay, he said, hey, guys, we shouldn't do this, but he didn't do enough. Here he steps up, and he says, Dad, he goes, listen, he goes, if we lose Benjamin, you can have my two oldest kids, which I, that completely blows me away. It must have been a thing back then. Uh, but he says, listen, and, I, and I, I think it's somewhere along the lines of this. How many have ever, like, you know, swore on your parents or swore on your children? Hey, I promise I will do this. I swear on my kids that this will happen, right? So I don't know if it's something like that, but he offers up his two kids, and, 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 and Jacob is just like, no, 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 no. We're going to shut it down. This isn't going to happen. We're, we're not going to move forward with this. Have you ever, is, have circumstances ever been so tough with you that it just causes you to freeze, right? You don't know if you're supposed to go left or you're supposed to go right. And, and really, you just, you just don't want to do anything and just hope that the situation disappears. Anyone ever been like that? You just hope the situation disappears. I, 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 can't, I can't even talk to you right now. I don't, I don't even want to deal with this right now. Well, the famine is real, and we're going to pick this up in, in, in chapter 43, in verse 1. It says, Now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father, Jacob, says to them, Okay, go back to Egypt and buy just a little bit of grain. Buy just a little bit. Maybe you can slip in, get a little bit, and then come back out. Because he st still doesn't want Benjamin to go. And, and, th this is, and, and this is when Judah, okay, and it's important that Judah steps in here, because if you go back to the beginning of the story, when they sold Joseph into Egypt, it was Judah's idea to actually sell him away. So Judah now steps up, okay? Judah steps up and he says, listen, he goes, Dad, if we go back to Egypt, we have to take Benjamin with us. We have to take Benjamin with us. If we don't, he's going to, it's, it's all for naught. We're not going to be able to come back. This has to happen. And he, so Reuben suggested his way, and, it, and, and the dad wasn't in the position to listen to it. Maybe it was Reuben himself. Judas suggests this, and he says, Dad, we have to step in. Look at verse 8 of chapter 43. And I, I think this is why Judah made a little bit more sense, because he pleaded for life. Judas said to Israel's father, Send the boy with me, and we will arise, and we will go that we may live and not die, both we and you and our little ones, I will be a pledge of his safety, and from my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame for everyone. I think Judas stepped up. Amazing how a man changes after he has his own children, right? Amazing how a man changes after he has his own children. Judas steps up, he pleads for life. And here's what happens. Israel agrees. Israel agrees. We, we can see this in verse 8. Judas said to Israel's father, send the boy with me. Now in verse 11, then the father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choicest fruits of the land in your bags. Carry a present down from the man, a little balm, a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother. Arise and go to the man. And then verse 14, May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back you another brother and your other brother Benjamin. And as for me, if I'm bereaved of my children, I'm also bereaved. Point number one is this. It's easy to blame God. Point number two is this. It's easy to blame others. And Jacob came to a point where he really did blame those kids. And then point number three, it's time to trust in God. Point number three is this, it's time to trust in God. And that's exactly what Israel does, is he trusts in God. I think it's important that we look at this verse here. Genesis chapter 32, 27 
and 30 and 28 if we can look at this one so israel so what is the importance of the name change well we'll see in an earlier story in, in genesis chapter 32 we'll see that there is a fight that happens between jacob and a man now it may be god right I, we think it was god all right so he, he gets in his wrestling match with this man all night long jacob ends up hurting his hip and at the end of the confrontation the man that he was wrestling with says to him from this point forward your name is now israel and you know what israel means him who has striven with god and with man and I think it's interesting when we look at this story that the story uses the word Jacob and also uses the word Israel because Israel struggled with God. Israel struggled with God. It's easy to blame others. It's easy to blame others, but there comes the time, a point where it's time to trust in God. It's time to trust in God. When life seems uncooperative, it's easy to blame others. It's easy to blame God. But it's time to trust in God. What do you do when life seems uncooperative? Now, I want everyone just to take a big breath. Go ahead. One, one, two, three. So what does that mean for me? Why is this important? Why is this story important? First of all, I want to talk to you about the larger plot line. There's a bigger story that's going on. And we see this in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a lion that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. There's a larger story here. Why is this important? Because God has a plan for the children of Israel. And, a, and, and, and as we know, it's a plan for them to go into Egypt to be slaves there, and for them to deliver them through the exodus. That's the larger plan. This is the story on how God brings the children of Israel into Egypt for 400 years of for captivity. That's the bigger plot line. And a plan for God to save humanity. For God to be the one that the children of, of, of uh, Israel depend on. Why is this important to me? Why is this important to me? And, and, and here's the important thing is this. Redemption, forgiveness, and God's sovereignty in bringing this family back together. There's a big story. God is orchestrating events to be able to bring the children of Israel into Egypt. But there's also a smaller story going on. And the smaller story, story in, in, involves redemption. It involves uh, repentance. It involves forgiveness and restoring this family back to one another. That's the smaller story. A story for us. There's deep secrets that needed to be dealt with with Joseph and his brothers. And this story is the story that God uses to bring them back in. Amen? So that's how it applies to us. When, when life seems uncooperative, when God seems uncooperative and, and nothing makes sense and everything is going crazy and isn't it in a tailspin, there's this, there's this understanding, there's this even though we don't, are not praising God in those times, there has to be this understanding that God, that what's going on with you is not escaping God's attention. And even though we want to blame others, and even though we want to blame God, there has to be a time where we turn and we trust Him. There has to be a time where we turn and trust Him. Israel, it took him a while to get to that point, but he turned and trusted God. This morning, where are you at? What happens when God seems uncooperative? What happens when God seems uncooperative? Would you stand with me uh, this morning? And let's go ahead and close in a moment of prayer.